Welcome to Wildlife at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo. I'm Dr. Larry Kilmar, Vice President of Animal Science and Conservation. And I'm with Jose today, who's with Beck Corporation. And they're the company building our new hospital and commissary. And right behind me, the commissary is going up as we speak. So Jose, welcome. And tell us some of the challenges working inside of a zoo. Well, to begin with, you know, it's unique to work around animals. So every time that we have a vendor coming to, to visit us or de delivering materials or, you know, doing work, we need to tell them that it's not okay to go around the cages or, you know, petting some animal, which is everybody's tempted to do that. Because it's so, so funny, you know, we are, you know, working around animals and they want to have a shot or a picture to them. Right. So that's the one thing we need to work around, you know, being educating the people. And we go through a lot of training with them to make sure that they understand the rules to work inside the zoo. Yeah, it certainly is different than, than perhaps building a shopping mall where you don't need to worry about all these other activities that are going on. But we do have a collection here. We do have a hospital that's still operating in the middle of this construction zone as the new one is being built. So there's some really, really interesting challenges. And we meet almost every two weeks now to discuss some of those challenges. And uh, any funny stories you want to tell us about what's happened in the last few months? Oh, you know, I cannot really think of one right now, but I can tell you that when we started this, this project here, you know, we needed to figure out a way to keep you guys operational. And working inside this zoo and keeping this clinic operations being a challenge to, from day one. So really when we started the demolition, you know, we talked about how we're going to be, you know, putting a wall next to the existing clinic and then trying to dig next to it. And after we dig, you know, we actually saw that the foundation was larger than what we anticipated. So that's something that we started looking into some of the unforeseen conditions here. So. I cannot really think of something really funny right now, but again, you know, it's just some unique challenges of while working next to an existing facility and trying to do our work is still here, you know. Well, as I mentioned in our previous programs, this is certainly an exciting time for us. This construction, this project will now uh, catapult Lowry Park into the top 10% of the institutions in the country with a new hospital, science center, and commissary. So as you're walking on that Florida boardwalk visiting the zoo, uh, take, a, take a look to your right and you'll see this facility under construction. The hospital site is right behind me right now and of course the footings are just being dug as we speak. This facility will now encompass a new pharmacy, uh, sterile surgery, treatment, as well as office space for our, our medical staff. Giving an idea, our present hospital uh, space we have right now will be about the size of our new pharmacy. So this is a, a very positive upgrade for the institution. Again, uh, brings us into that 10% of the other zoos in the country with a state-of-the-art medical facility. So Jose, we're now you know starting to dig footings here and this is really the most important leg of this project is the hospital itself. and. Uh, I know you've done a lot, all the civil work has been done uh, already and now we're starting to, as they say, come up out of the ground. So what, what was part of that civil work? What things needed to be done before we could begin putting footings in? Well, one of the things that probably we don't see right now is that there used to be overhead lines that belong to Tico that we needed to relocate to make, you know, the room for the new footprint of the building. And part of the things that we did also, we created a new road that uh, goes on the south side of this property that will allow us to then detour all the traffic that goes to the zoo and go to that row and then let us take this footprint and start building this building. So, well, this, this footprint is essentially in the middle of the zoo, so you can imagine how the amount of disruption we have going on just in our daily activity. But we have to operate seven days a week, 24 hours a day, in order to service the collection. It's been a great relationship with Beck and the other subcontractors working around this site and working around all the strange things that we, we need to get done in our daily life. But uh, again, as we show you over the next coming months, you will start to see this facility really take shape. So again, as I mentioned before, when you're on the Florida boardwalk, just take a look to your right and you'll see this wonderful facility coming up out of the ground. We're in our present treatment facility in our existing hospital, and I'm with uh, Associate Veterinarian Dr. Trevor Gerlach, who 
uh, is relatively new to the organization, but uh, it's coming at a great time when we're about ready to open up a new hospital. So, so Trevor, we're standing in our treatment room right now that's about, oh, I don't know, 18 by 20 foot square, and uh, our new clinic is going to have just a fantastic uh, array of uh, rooms and, and opportunities to make sure we're providing the best medical care we can for our collection. So uh, from your point of view, uh, uh, tell us some of the things you're looking forward to in this new facility. Yeah, so this is kind of, this is our main treatment rooms. This is where we do all of our, anything that needs to be sterile, anything that's more than just kind of cleaning off the dirt, we do in here. Um, and we do have great equipment. We've got digital radiography, we've got ultrasonography, we've got scopes, we've got a ton of stuff, all squeezed into this little tiny space. So, the new clinic will afford us different rooms for different things. So we can have a room to do scoping, we can have a room to do surgeries, which is ideal. Um, so really here we're just working with a very limited space. So when you get animals in here the size of a manatee, obviously you've got keeper staff, vet staff, everything. Everyone's kind of stumbling over each other. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Yeah, the room, the room fills up fast, as you said. The other part of this is we'll have an extensive uh, series of, of holding pens and recovery pens for the animals that are under medical care, which, which is important. They need quiet time. They need to have... Uh, you know, the closeness to the veterinary staff and, and medical staff so they can keep an eye on on the post-surgical or post-treatment uh, operations that are going on. So as we, as we like to say, our uh, pharmacy, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the new hospital will be about the size of the room we're in right now. So this is going to afford us great room, which is important because what's available to us now medically, treatment-wise, the technology, uh, well, it may not take up space, it does require the right kind of facilities to treat. And I, I think you would agree with that. You've probably been compromised to here trying to get certain things done. Any, any cases that uh, come to mind right now where you felt, boy, with the new hospital, this would be just so much nicer? I mean, not so much an individual case, but doing surgery in this room, um, like we said. So you've got these great skylights here, which afford natural lighting, which is economical. And, um, uh, but when you're trying to look at a radiograph or you're trying to look into the eye of something, it's, um, it's a bit crippling. So um, just looking forward to things like that. Um, over here we've got an air unit that unfortunately blows cold air into our surgical field, which is also not ideal. And so we have to put shields up when we're doing surgical procedures. Um, so little modifications of things like that that just will make our lives a lot easier. I mean, the detail that goes into this planning is extensive. It's been going on for a couple of years, uh, not unlike a, a human hospital planning. In fact, a lot of very similar uh, applications are used in the veterinary medicine as we use in human medicine. So, so again, exciting time for everybody at Lowry Park, and we're looking forward to having a, a state-of-the-art facility. Thank you, Trevor. Trevor, uh, explain the medical treatment you were, uh, you're doing on this tortoise. Yeah, so basically these tortoises came to us with some, some defects in the shell. So some of the outer shell uh, was actually chipping off. So tortoises are very cool animals. This is actually keratin, so this is very much like what's in your, uh, your fingernails, and it covers bone. So they're one of the only species that has a rib cage outside of their body, right? So um, underlying this keratin, as I said, was bone. Um, when that bone gets exposed, um, you can get ailments because of that, so bacterial infections, fungal infections. Um, and so these animals actually came to us with some degree of shell lesions that have over time just progressed. And so what we've done here is gone in, um, just like you would do any other wound, uh, we've gone in, we've kind of debrided away um, all the old necrotic tissue um, to try to get that away from the body um, so it can heal quicker. Um, and then these animals are, um, right now we're just kind of in a transition trying to figure out where, where to put them as far as a habitat goes um, that would be better suited for the lesions that they have. So, so uh, how long will this process take? How long will they be in the hospital, for instance, before you're ready to release them? Um, well, because we have limited space, um, this is literally the only stall that we have um, right now open for hospitalizing animals. So, um, and these lesions are chronic lesions. Um, these animals, um, over time, would likely heal these things on their own. Um, we're basically trying to speed that process up. Um, so these animals will be with us probably until we figure out where we can better manage them outside in sunlight, all these things that are good for healing. Um, so they'll be with us probably for a week or so, and then we'll hopefully transition them into an outdoor habitat that we still have access to um, to provide medical therapy. Well, as you can see, it's not always about giraffes and rhinos and elephants. It's about tortoises too, and the the care that goes into all the different varieties of animals here is is uh, incredible. And veterinarians have to be able to treat anything from a finch uh, up to an elephant. And, and so knowing the right procedure 
the right way to approach uh, a situation like this is, uh, is very important. So as you can see, uh, from tortoises to rhinos to elephants uh, can be on the agenda of a veterinarian at Lowry Park Zoo any day. We oftentimes talk about the serious work of conservation that zoos do, and, and this particular subject I think is compelling. Behind me are our African elephants, and today 96 elephants will be poached in Africa. Nearly 35,000 a year will lose their life because of ivory. And so there's the 96 elephant campaign that's now starting in the United States. And most all the accredited zoos in, in North America have signed up for it or will be signing up in the near future. And, and the point of bringing this to your attention is that as a visitor to the zoo and as a consumer, read and, and, and become familiar with these issues when it comes to uh, elephant poaching that's going on right now. And, and speak with your voice and make sure that people understand that this is unacceptable. Uh, Asian elephants are in the same situation. Uh, the numbers aren't as dramatic, but again, elephants are losing their life every day because of ivory. So again, zoos play an important role. We play an, a role sometimes that we're not comfortable with, but these elephants behind us now are safe for the rest of their life. Not the case in Africa right now. So dramatic numbers, rhinos this year, uh, for instance, over a thousand animals poached. Uh, that's one every nine hours. Uh, in 2013. So this situation now is, is out of control and uh, there are efforts to stop it. The governments are working at stopping it, but it's important that you understand that the, the role that zoos play is to help protect animals from situations like that and propagate so that there will be elephants and rhinos around for our children's children to see, but also be aware of these issues as you read the newspaper and, and surf the web to see what's going on with conservation around the world. front of our tufted deer exhibit. A tufted deer is a small antelope that comes from mainland China. And it gets its name because it has a tuft of hair between the horns uh, on the top of his head. Now this animal is not commonly found in zoos. And some of the first animals were imported into the United States in the 80s. Uh, and the population has done very well in captivity. And this is Lowry Park's first calf. Now it's gonna be tough probably to see this baby today, but but I'm with Katie, the keeper who takes care of the tufted deer. And uh, tell us how the baby's doing and how mother's doing. They're doing really well. Um, she brings them out in the exhibit every day to get sun. And um, they have a night house, so they go in there at night to sleep. But she's nursing really well. They're um, out and about. He's running around, which is a good yeah. sign that they're happy outside. 
And they do hide this baby. There's hiders and followers in the animal world, and tufted deer uh, are hiders. So mother will actually place this baby in a location, and it's purposely done that way so that baby can gain some strength and size so it can eventually start to follow mother. Uh, usually babies that are uh, of hiders uh, have a very high fat content because mother doesn't nurse them uh, regularly. The calf's not up and running next to mother like a cow, for instance, so it relies on a very heavy fat content so it can go for several hours without having to nurse or eat. So we seem to be past that kind of hiding phase now, and she's starting to come out some more. Uh, have you seen anything interesting in the exhibit with the baby yet? Um, the first time I saw him leap over the stream was <laughs> Pretty amazing seeing such thing, you know, something so small and young being able to just cruise right over it. Yeah, that's right. And they typically have just one offspring at a time, and and again, a very unique species, and and one that's uh, part of our SSP program here. And and these animals, what is the diet for the uh, fem the adult female and male? They both get a main diet of grain. They also get a head of romaine every day, and then every day we cut browse for them. They're browsers. Um, so we'll cut oak, hibiscus, mulberry, um, and they get that every night to browse on. Now after this baby was born, we wait a few days and we do what's called a veterinarian check to make sure the baby looks good, take a blood sample, make sure that the baby has, appears to have good weight and measurements. And were you here the day they did the vet check? Unfortunately not. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was off the next day, so that's when they had done it. But um, I heard it went really well. And we, we do that purposely because, again, we don't want to disturb the animals, but we just want to make, a, make sure that everything's going well and that mother is being attentive, and especially a first-time mother. So when you're out at Lowry Park, go to the Asia area and up the boardwalk on your right, just before you get to Indian rhinos, are the tufted deer. We're in front of the Angolan colobus exhibit, and we have two new arrivals, and I'm with Jane, the primary keeper for this area. So, Jane, uh, when were our two babies born? We had one baby born a week ago yesterday, which was February, uh, I'm sorry, January the 29th, and then we had one born yesterday, February the 4th. And when they're born, they are solid white, and so you can see behind us, uh, that animal stands out quite a bit compared to the adults. Uh, we really don't know why, they, why that's that way. Science hasn't really figured out a good answer, at least not one I can find anyway. But these babies will stay this color for three or four months, correct, and then they'll start to change? Right, around um, two and a half to three months, you really start to see the drastic color change. It happens first on their arms and legs and tail and around the eyes, and then it seems like suddenly overnight they look like little miniature colobus. Yeah, yeah. They, there's uh, several species of Angol of colobus in general. Uh, we happen to uh, house Angolan colobus at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo, and it is part of an SSP. It's a species of lesser concern, but it's important for us to keep track of all primates because of the habitat pressures that all of these animals are coming under in Africa. So this animal ranges in eastern Africa into the Congo Basin uh, and can live in pretty high altitudes. And I think it's probably one of the more dramatic looking of the colobus with that long hair coat. So what's our, the primary diet of a colobus? These guys actually have a specialized diet. They have a very specialized digestive system. They eat almost exclusively leaves in the wild. And so leaves are very difficult to digest. So they um, actually basically ruminate their food. They'll take in a lot of food in the mornings. They spend a lot of the day just sitting around kind of burping it back up, chewing it again and swallowing it to kind of break down all the cellulose that's in there. Um, so they, um, they uh, here they get a specialized diet of primate biscuits that are made for leaf-eating monkeys, and it has all the basic nutri nu nutrients they would need um, on a daily basis that they don't get here because they, in the captivity, because they don't have as many varieties of leaves to eat here. But we do um, give them browse on a daily basis as well to supplement the diet. So they get the biscuits that are made especially for the leaf-eating monkeys, and then they get a lot of varied browse and um, uh, sorted fruits and vegetables and uh, lots of greens. Yeah. We try to um, give them all the same nutrients that they would get in the wild so they would um, flourish here as well. That's a big part of our nutritional program. Again, she referred to leaf eaters. These are called leaf eater monkeys because they eat leaves, and it's important for us to know that so that we are providing the right supplements. Diets are essential. When you have a collection of this value, you've got to make sure that you're taking care of them on the medical side and the nutrition side. The other thing I want to point out this time is you'll notice on our sign here, we have several categories from low risk, which is highlighted for the Angolan colobus, all the way out to extinct in the wild. Now these categories are determined by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. That's a group of international biologists that determine the endangerment classification for all the species that we know of in the world. 
birds, mammals, reptiles, you name it. And then our government also has a series of classifications. So the U.S. government has what's called the Endangered Species Act. And so that will be endangered, vulnerable, or threatened and vulnerable. They usually complement one another. If an animal is considered critically endangered, our government would also call it endangered, but not in all cases. So we have a lot of science that backs up the determination of where these animals fit and what kinds of conservation efforts we need to employ to make sure that we keep these animals uh, in good captive populations. So the next time you're at the zoo, you'll see many signs that have these classifications. And again, this is all uh, done through our international science uh, researchers and our national science researchers that help us determine uh, where these animals fit in this big conservation picture. So uh, we're pretty excited. This is over 30 colobus babies we've had now at the zoo over quite a history of time. And we would expect that these babies will stay with mother, pretty close to mother for about how long? Uh, here for about four to five years on average. Um, the females normally in the wild would stay in their natal group and the males would immigrate out once they reach sexual maturity. And so basically as soon as the baby is born and we know the sex, we are notify the SSP, which is the Species Survival Program. And they start to, at that point, look ahead into the future to where these animals will be placed eventually. But uh, they will stay with the group for probably about four years on average here. And they uh, get a lot of experience with younger um, babies being born in the group. The females get babysitting experience and helps them become better moms so when they do move onto another facility, they will be ready to, to be a good mom there too. That's a huge change in our industry over the years that we leave the babies with the natal group for many years. That way they, as Jane said, know how to be good mothers or good fathers, depending on what the case is. The two animals that uh, produce these babies were part of an SSP recommended transfer from another zoo. So again, we're helping perpetuate that 80%, 90% genetic variability over 100 years, which is so important in these programs. So next time you're at Lowry Park, come into the primate area and look in the colobus exhibit and you're gonna see two brand new babies. Well, as you can see, everybody's excited about our show. Thank you for joining us at Wildlife at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo.